I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join me on a quest to find awe and wonder in all nature, human or wild, vast or small, encounters that move us beyond words. So one of my favorite things to do as a little girl was to look at a landscape and erase the present day uh, markers on the landscape and imagine what it would have looked like in earlier times. I was always pretending in the woods. I would be gathering weeds and berries and pretending to make soups and stews and pretending that I was homesteading. Rachel Jamison Webster has never outgrown those woods or imagined landscapes. And those freewheeling childhood fantasies? Well, today they've evolved into a mature fascination with former times and bygone people. Rachel is a creative writing professor at Northwestern University, but grew up in Madison, Ohio, on the shores of Lake Erie. Her own people had been living in the northeast outskirts of the Cleveland area for several generations. And she always knew her family had settled there around the Civil War a century and a half ago. I did know a family story about my ancestors settling in the area where we lived and encountering the land and living on the land. And so... I had this relationship to place that was also a relationship to the past. My grandparents were very much of the 20th century in that they were interested in the present and the future. They were not waxing sentimental about the past, but I would always ask them to tell me stories. And I was a very insistent child around learning the stories. I would look at photographs with my grandmother and memorize all the names of my grandparents' siblings, and they had between them 20 siblings. So I was trying to keep track of things and hear the stories. The inquisitive young Rachel, insistent though she was, never accessed a certain set of circumstances in the family's background. There were things her grandparents wouldn't or perhaps could not tell her. What young Rachel was never told, is that her ancestors had straddled and then crossed the color line that has divided America since its founding. There was no way for her to know that among her ancestors were some of the earliest mixed marriages in colonial American history. In this episode of Constant Wonder, we'll examine where her family really came from, and we'll learn what Rachel learned. Her journey entailed the discovery of cousins, not so very distant relatives, actually, but complete strangers. Now, as I've mentioned, Rachel is a writer, so once she had learned the truth about her complex family story, her next move, writing a book, was really never in doubt. It's titled Benjamin Banneker and Us, Eleven Generations of an American Family. As I understand it, you thought that you were English, French, uh, Native American, and Hungarian. Yeah. And then you go to this wedding and your cousin Nathan steps up and you start talking about stuff. Yes. Well, we're at a wedding. It's 2016. So tensions are high in the country. And there was a very important rising awareness of the sacredness of stories and the right for people in a group to define stories for themselves. So I was talking about this with my cousin, Nathan. We were having a really great intellectual discussion. And all of a sudden he said, well, it's especially interesting when you think of most Americans' mixtures of ancestry and mixed race ancestry, including ours. And I said, what do you mean? A mutual cousin to Rachel and Nathan, Melissa, was the first of the known cousins to start rebuilding a broken bridge to the past. The truth had been hiding in plain sight. All it took was for a a determined genealogist like Melissa to detect an anomaly, an incongruity. And as she surveyed all the puzzle pieces before her, she scratched her head and said, hmm, what's this big gap doing here? And as she was looking, she noticed that one line hadn't been filled in as well. And this line had an M next to people's names for mulatto. And so 
she understood that this was the line of the family that hadn't been integrated, it hadn't been acknowledged. What Melissa's efforts revealed was a bigger eye-opener than your average case of mistaken identity or a hidden past. Those situations are dime a dozen. But what came into focus for Melissa and then Nathan and then Rachel was the story of an ostensibly Caucasian family of Ohio, a family named Let, L-E-T-T, that could trace its origin directly back to a significant free black family of the pre-Civil War era. Well, even earlier than that, actually. Clear back to the pre-Revolutionary War era. With a solid link to a famous figure, a luminary in black American history and American intellectual history, a man named Benjamin Banneker. This Benjamin Banneker also happens to have been an early, unflinching voice for racial equality in America. And she started doing the research and discovered that we were related to Aquila and Christina Lett, who were our ancestors, and they were the children of Jemima Banneker and Samuel Delaney Lett, and Jemima Banneker was the sister of Benjamin Banneker. So this research that Melissa did connected us with all of these extraordinary African-American stories, and it also connected us with our African-American and African ancestry, which had been denied in our family. I can only imagine you jumped at the opportunity to learn more about Benjamin Banneker. Had you even heard his name before? No, I had never heard of him. And I felt very embarrassed about that, that I had never learned about this great black intellectual of the revolutionary era. So, yes, I came home from that wedding just extremely excited to learn about him Benjamin Banneker was a farm owner, a free African-American citizen, born in 1731 in Maryland, a contemporary of the Founding Fathers. He was unusually well-versed in the science of his day. He was an almanac writer, a clockmaker, a surveyor, an astronomer, a thinker. And to go with all of that, he had gumption. And I suspect it was his gumption that put his biggest mark on history. You know the expression, speak truth to power? Eight years after the Revolutionary War was won, in August 1791, Banneker wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, then Secretary of State for President George Washington, and soon to become president in his own right and is well known. This Jefferson was a slave owner. Banneker had been employed by Jefferson in the grand project of surveying and laying out the dimensions of the future District of Columbia. So he was no stranger to the celebrated politician. The letter from Banneker to Jefferson is elegantly written. The lion's share is all about a simple question posed over and over again relative to Jefferson's stance on slavery. Along with the letter, Banneker also sends a copy of his 1791 Scientific Astronomical Almanac, which he rightly surmises will be of considerable interest to a scientifically progressive thinker like Jefferson. Let me read for you a few lines from this stunning document. There was a time in which you clearly saw into the injustice of a state of slavery, and in which you had just apprehensions of the horrors of its condition. It was now, sir, that your abhorrence thereof was so excited that you publicly held forth this true and invaluable doctrine which is worthy to be recorded and remembered in all succeeding ages. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is what came in response. I thank you sincerely for your letter of the 19th instant and for the almanac it contained. Nobody wishes more than I do to see such proofs as you exhibit, that nature has given to our black brethren talents equal to those of the other colors of men, and that the appearance of the want of them 
is owing merely to the degraded condition of their existence, both in Africa and America. I can add with truth that nobody wishes more ardently to see a good system commenced for raising the condition both of their body and mind. I have taken the liberty of sending your almanac to Monsieur de Condorcet, Secretary of the Academy of Sciences at Paris, and member of the Philanthropic Society, because I considered it as a document to which your whole color had a right for their justification, against the doubts which have been entertained of them. I am, with great esteem, sir, your most obedient, humble servant, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson's polite response doesn't convey how he likely feels about Banneker's challenge, issued as it was by a fellow free citizen, a black American, directly calling Jefferson out for hypocrisy. That very same day, however, Jefferson forwards the almanac to the Marquis de Condorcet across the Atlantic Ocean. The Marquis is not only a prominent French philosopher and mathematician, but mark this, he is also an outspoken abolitionist. Listen to what Jefferson pens to the Marquis immediately after what had just transpired. I am happy to be able to inform you that we have now in the United States a Negro, the son of a black man born in Africa, and of a black woman born in the United States, who is a very respectable mathematician. I have seen very elegant solutions of geometrical problems by him. Add to this that he is a very worthy and respectable member of society. He is a free man. I shall be delighted to see these instances of moral eminence so multiplied as to prove that the want of talents observed in them is merely the effect of their degraded condition, and not proceeding from any difference in the structure of the parts on which intellect depends. So Jefferson reaches out to Condorcet with the almanac, expressing his view that talent, intellect, and moral eminence have characterized its author, Benjamin Banneker, as a living, breathing, flesh-and-blood argument for abolition. Jefferson does not, however, broach the matter of his own hypocrisy, even though Banneker left that door wide open. In fact, I stand in awe of Banneker and his letter every time I read such lines as these. But, sir, how pitiable it is to reflect that although you were so fully convinced of the benevolence of the Father of Mankind, and of his equal and impartial distribution of those rights and privileges which he had conferred upon them, that you should at the same time counteract his mercies in detaining by fraud and violence so numerous a part of my brethren under groaning captivity and cruel oppression, that you should at the same time be found guilty of that most criminal act which you professedly detested in others with respect to yourselves. This letter to Thomas Jefferson is one of the great documents of American history. It's very important to Rachel's story, but it's scarcely Banneker's only claim to fame. We'll touch on a number of his other contributions later, but for the moment, think what it must have been like for Rachel to learn about this eminent and extraordinary relative. As a free black man, a proud brother of his fellow African Americans, Benjamin Banneker could not hold back from asking Jefferson and I'm only slightly paraphrasing here. When you wrote those words in the opening lines of the Declaration of Independence, did you believe them? Do you stand by them, or were you lying? For everything you are, Mr. Thomas Jefferson, are you also a hypocrite? Talk of human dignity and equality isn't merely the way this letter opens. It's the bulk of what Benjamin Banneker has to say. Presenting his 1791 almanac as a gift comes only at the tail end, practically an afterthought, a social courtesy, maybe an olive branch, but after such a searing indictment. We'll come back to the almanac later, or I should say almanacs in the plural, because there were 28 different editions published in several cities. As an annual periodical, it had a good run, 
for 11 consecutive years from 1791 until 1802. I'm Marcus Smith. Our guest in this episode is Rachel Webster. She's author of Benjamin Banneker and Us, 11 Generations of an American Family. Let's go back now and pick up our conversation at the point when this veil over the family's past was just beginning to lift for Rachel. So do you go home after that encounter with Nathan and the new information comes? You just go home and try not to think about the change in your life? And does it take a week or two or three or four weeks before you realize, I can't get this off my mind? Oh, no. I went home and I was obsessed with it. I was so excited (laughs) that my cousin and my brother actually called me out on my excitement, right? So there's a whole moment in the text where Nathan says, he calls everyone in the family to tell them. And I said, well, what did my brother say? Nathan said, well, your brother thought it was cool, but he said, wow, I bet Rachel is really excited. And Nathan said, I know you're excited about this, but don't, whatever you do, don't act like this makes you black. That was not him denying our African ancestry. That was him calling me out on claiming an identity in a simplistic way or in a self, in an acquisitional way. I have African and African-American ancestry, and I am proud of that, and I embrace that. And I also did not grow up in Black culture, and I don't walk through the world as a Black person. So that's the line I'm walking here. Slightly chastened, yes, but with undiminished passion for this new information, weighing what she would do with it, Rachel was about to find herself grafted back into a branch of her extended family from which she, her parents, and her grandparents had apparently been cut off. We'll follow that story of a remarkable grafting into a tree of contemporary cousins a little bit later on. It'll be worth the wait. Right now, though, I must not fail to tell you that Benjamin Banneker's story was by no means the only story to emerge from obscurity for Rachel. There are other people equally compelling in their own right with equally urgent stories to tell, all of whom now seem to be beckoning for Rachel to to do some of the telling. As Rachel was just beginning to recognize herself as connected to this wholly unsuspected legacy. Now, as with any family story that isn't personally your very own, all those relationships, wives to husbands, parents to children, that can get lost in the telling. So I'm not going to quiz you about who married whom. I'm not going to ask you to memorize any charts. That's somebody else's job. My invitation to you right now is just to appreciate the overall spirit of the wonderful cast of characters Rachel can tell us about. Just hum the tune with us without trying to remember all the words. And with that said, the Banneker and Lett family story begins with a young white woman of the lowest ranks of English society. Molly was a dairymaid growing up in England in the late 1600s. England was filled with poor people at this point, and especially orphaned young people. And there were a lot of people who were basically homeless or they had only gig jobs where they would go to the big company town where there was a dairy, for instance, and women would milk cows. You know that old saying, don't cry over spilled milk? Well, whoever coined that phrase had never heard about Molly the milkmaid. Her story, according to oral tradition, goes this way. Molly spills a bucket of milk says the cow kicked it over. She's accused of having stolen the missing milk and is accused of grand larceny. And what comes next sounds completely bonkers to modern ears. In Molly's day, English law was beyond harsh. Theft, even if it amounted to a very small sum, was a capital crime. So without any foreseeable way to mount a defense against her accuser, uh, orphaned milkmaids can't afford lawyers, Well, Molly was well on her way toward execution. She was going to hang for the offense, but she pled the benefit of clergy, which meant that if you could prove that you could read and you were a devout member of the church, you could plead for a pardon. So 
apparently Molly could read and was given a pardon and her pardon was indentured servitude in Maryland. So she arrived, according to the oral histories, in 1683 And indentures at that time were seven years. So she probably worked until around 1690. There were oral histories that said that after that, she purchased two enslaved men to help her on her farm. And she freed them and married one named Banaka. Banaka then becomes the patriarch of the family. They have four daughters, one of whom is Mary Banneker, who is the mother of Benjamin Banneker. But did the early chroniclers of this story tell it right? Did the freed Englishwoman Molly actually buy and then free an enslaved African named Banaka? Rachel Webster now has her doubts about some of the details here. We've always wondered how Molly, as an indentured servant and a woman alone, could have had the money and the ability to buy her own land and then even buy enslaved people, even if she freed them right away. And recent documents, and as well as my own contextual research, make me wonder if this happened differently and actually in a much more common way, which is that indentured servants and African servants at that time lived together, they ate together, they celebrated together, and they were very likely to marry one another and have children together. In fact, the very first laws that started to legislate race and name whiteness in law did so to make it illegal for white indentured servant women to marry African men. These women were marrying African men in such high numbers that there were all kinds of stereotypes and slurs about it. So what I think actually happened, and we can trace this in documents that just surfaced during the time I was writing the book, I think that Molly and Banaka were workers together on Newman's plantation, and they would have met that way. And they would have been working side by side. They would have come from completely different cultures. They had different skin tone. But it is not unbelievable to think that they would have fallen in love and had these children, these four daughters, that resulted in Mary Banneker, who was then the mother of Benjamin Banneker. So of the four daughters born to Molly and Banneka, Mary is the one we're focused on here, born to an English mother and African father in 1699. Now imagine what life might be like for you as a mixed-race child in colonial America. Would the social hierarchy make place for you? What kind of legal status might you enjoy? Who might object and then contest any sort of membership you might want in a group or any sort of common franchise or privilege? Indenture was based on who your parents were. If you had one African parent, you were likely to be indentured. And if you got pregnant as a woman during indenture, your term of servitude would be extended. So you can see how these early indenture laws in the Chesapeake were setting the legal precedent for enslavement and for the idea that the condition of the child comes through the mother. One way to see it is that during this period, no one was quite yet sure what to make of the legal and social status of the children of mixed marriages. The institution of slavery often marched along in a legal haze with a fair amount of improvisation. A person like Mary, the daughter of Molly and Bunny Khan, would sense this all too well. So when she was grown to the age of 31, her own indenture finally completed, Mary appeared in court. She petitioned to secure freedom for her own children. We can now say some things about Mary Banneker that are fairly definite. We had a lot of stories about her from the oral histories about her as an adult. But now we have a document where she was arguing in the provincial court of Maryland, which was the highest court in the land, for the freedom of her own children. And in that document, she begins by saying, my mother was a white woman the servant of John Newman. 
And she goes on to explain that she was indentured for 31 years. Now, this means that her father was an African man and her mother was a white woman, because at that time, that was one of the ways they were keeping women from marrying black men, African men, by punishing their children. So any woman who had children with an African man, her children would be enslaved either for life or they would be indentured for 31 years. Now at that time in colonial life, that was the greater part of most people's lives. And it was also the prime reproductive years. So then those people would have children while in indenture and their children would be indentured. The stakes during Mary's court appearance were high. With a black man named Robert as her own husband, despite the fact that this Robert had long since earned his own freedom, Mary was taking on the colonial power structure and everything was on the line for her children. What if the generation after her was to be forced into indenture and then the next? Well, you see the problem. The system was rigged to be a cycle. Her court hearing was to be a defining moment for the Banneker family. We have this argument in court that Mary Banneker makes saying that these laws are unjust and repugnant. So it's an amazing moment in the story because she would have been about three months pregnant with Benjamin when she argued in court. She has just gotten out of her own indenture and has married Robert Banneker has gone to the court to argue for the freedom of her older children. And in that court, she has the courage to stand up against these magistrates, against these lawmakers, and speak for justice, for racial justice, and especially for the justice of her children. Do we know if her case succeeded? So we do know that her case succeeded, which means that she was able to get her children out of indenture at age 21, and 16, 16 for the girls and 21 for her son. This means that then when those children are having children, they have the opportunity to be free. A quick recap now. Mary, daughter of Molly the milkmaid and a man known as Banaka, kidnapped in Africa and shipped to Maryland, stands up in court as a free woman who has just barely finished her own indenture and wins the freedom of her children. What we haven't told you yet is that her husband, Robert, also appears to have pulled off some impressive victories. Robert Banneker, Benjamin's father, he was said to be a really enterprising and brilliant man. According to the oral histories, he escaped from enslavement three times. And then the fourth time, He was bought by someone who had more progressive ideas. Can you unriddle for me Robert's surname? Does he take Molly's name? Yes, that's what they always said, that he took the name of his wife's family because that had come from the African name Banaka. And then we don't know what his original surname may have been. We do not know. And Banaka does go back to a region in Senegal. And some have said that it connects to the word for nectar or honey, and it means a sweet disposition. So there are a few different theories on where the name comes from, but the oral history says that Robert took the name of his wife's family because it was an African name. And one thing we know is that the African names were subjugated. People were given the names of their master. So it is believable to me that if there's some connection to an African name, even if it's been changed through the generations, that that would be desirable to claim one's own name in that way. So in 1736, Robert Banneker bought a hundred acres of land and there's an elaborate indenture contract written out. These are all things we can document. And he bought it from this man, Richard Gist, who was a very prominent landowner 
in Maryland. He's from one of the oldest Maryland families, and his wife was a Quaker, and the Quakers were progressive abolitionists. So it looks like Richard Gist was becoming more and more abolitionist in his thinking. He must have been very impressed with Robert, and Robert was able to work overtime and buy his own freedom. And then by the time Mary was freed from her indenture and they were married, he was able to buy his own land. This actually happened when Benjamin was um, six years old. Robert had the foresight to put the deed in his name and Benjamin's name. So even though Benjamin was only a little boy, his name was written on the deed that he was a landowner. And that was a way to protect his freedom going forward. I don't think the family could have imagined how bad things would get before they would get better. Because at this point, we didn't have the massive investment in slavery that we would go on to have. But the family had enough foresight to know that they had to put their children's freedom in writing on paper in any way they could. And with Molly's six-year-old grandson owning land in Colonial Maryland, we've caught up to Benjamin. And as promised, we should fill in a few more blanks about him. He was born in 1731 and would live until 1806, having won a measure of fame in his own lifetime through diverse intellectual and scientific pursuits, from horticulture and clockmaking to tracking the movements of lights in the night sky, noting the passage of the astronomical cycles and seasons, from publishing his almanacs to goading the writer of the Declaration of Independence with his own sharp pen. Benjamin Banneker was a brilliant, brilliant person. The family story, and this is all recorded in his first biography by Martha Ellicott Tyson, that his grandmother taught him to read, Molly taught him to read, saved up money for him to attend a few years of school at a Quaker school where African-American and European children or white children were educated side by side. So they were in a Quaker neighborhood, which made his self-actualization more possible than it would have been almost anywhere else, certainly anywhere else in the South. And then he continued to teach himself. So he was reading, he was doing mathematics. The first way that Benjamin Banneker became famous, this happened in his early 20s because he designed a working clock entirely out of wood. At that time in the colonies, clocks were very unusual. They were very rare. And so he borrowed a pocket watch from a friend of his father's, a friend of Robert's. So you see that Robert must have had prominent friends, right? He borrowed a pocket watch, looked at it, took it apart, and memorized the way it worked. And then he carved all the gears out of wood. And remarkably, his clock was said to still work and chime the hours more than 50 years later when he died. So his clock made him famous. People would go out of their way to stop at his cabin, to see this clock, to hear about it. And he was very eloquent and he liked to present it to people and talk about his ideas and talk about how he had made it. So he was already something of a local celebrity and a known intellectual. At this time, it was rare for people to even be literate. So the fact that he was literate, he was well-read, he wrote, and he also designed his own clock, that put Benjamin Banneker on the map when he was in his 20s. An industrious learner in his waking hours, Banneker was also a pretty serious fellow about his sleep, which is to say that he often recorded his dreams after waking. I noted that Rachel herself seems inclined to do the same. Maybe it's a faint genetic impulse at play here? Yes. I write about dreams all the time myself. I have my first book of poems has many poems written from dreams. So as I was reading Benjamin Banneker's manuscript journal and I was seeing him writing out his dreams, I felt such a kindredness to him. And I related above all, I think, in this sense of wonder and this desire to make meaning of our lives and this feeling that there are messages of meaning all the time if we could only pay attention. 
So that is there in the way that he observed nature. He made all of these observations about his bees, his plants, the cosmos. And then he was also observing his own dreams and gleaning meaning that now we would describe psychologically, meaning from the subconscious. But in any case, he was gleaning meaning from the messages he would get in his dreams. They're very spiritual dreams. He was a scientist and he was also a person who had a humble sense of wonder and spirituality. I quote from one of his dreams in the book because I found it so moving. He has a dream in one point about his own death. And this is when he's older. It's toward the end of his life. And he dreams that he enters the Quaker meeting house, which is what he would attend. And he sees his friends, but he can no longer see any difference. He can't see race. He can't see gender. He can just see these glowing beings who are more beautiful and more whole than what we get to be on earth. And that is his dream. That's his afterlife dream. It's this dream of community where people are not actually hemmed in by all of the judgments and the differences that we get categorized by when we're alive. So I found his writing very poetic and, um, I felt humbled and happy to connect with him in that sort of mystical, poetic place while I was admiring his mathematical mind that is way beyond mine in terms of being able to do these computations and um, astronomical work. Let's talk a little bit more about that mathematical, computational mind. Innate intellect is one thing. Access to education and to a community of fellow scientists in a society divided by race, that's quite another. Benjamin's initial contact with Jefferson, you may recall, came by way of being hired to help survey what would become Washington, D.C. Benjamin got that gig through a close friendship he had formed with a white Quaker family named the Ellicotts. The Ellicott family moved to the region when he was in his 40s, and he became friends with one of the younger of the Ellicott brothers, George Ellicott, who was also an astronomer, and they really inspired each other intellectually. At this time, there was a huge debate in Quakerism around slavery, and so half of the Quaker church were fervent abolitionists including George Ellicott, who was best friends with Benjamin Banneker. And so Andrew Ellicott, who was the most famous surveyor of the time, he had already surveyed the Western Reserve, different parts of this growing country. He was hired to survey Washington, D.C., and he tried to hire his cousin, George, as his assistant. And George said, no, I'm too busy with the business back at home hire my friend. So because he was respected by this prominent Quaker family, his intelligence was able to become visible. He was already learning and studying and writing before all of this, but they had the access that certainly as an African-American man in the first years of this country, would have been unheard of to have that access. Finding inroads to well-educated society with assistance from sympathetic people of means, such as the Ellicott family, Benjamin Banneker eventually was in a position to produce his series of famous almanacs. What were these volumes, and why did people in his day care so much about them? Well, if you're acquainted with a farmer's almanac, That's a periodical published without interruption every year now since 1818, right to the present day. Well, that puts us on the right track to understand just what Banneker was about when he first set out to produce an almanac. He did the ephemeris, which is all the mathematics and the astronomical computations to compute, you know, when there will be an equinox, the rising and setting of the sun, all of these natural 
moments that were actually fundamentally important to farmers and to sailors. It was a very practical document. It would be like the iPhone to us today. I mean, it, it literally, it included exchange rates for currency. It included maps. It included the dates that the courts were meeting. And then this really important mathematical information about when the sun would rise, when it would set, all of this. He sent it to Jefferson, and Jefferson wrote back to him and then sent it to the head, um, the, the University of Sciences in Paris, with an enclosure note saying, I have met this man. I hired him to help survey Washington, D.C. He's a moral and reputable member of society. I've seen equations done by him. And we need to keep this on record as proof of what African people are capable of. So he kind of made it into a museum piece, right? That this is proof, but there was an exchange. There was an acknowledgement. In that time, even that would be worth so much. The acknowledgement that Rachel is talking about here is a significant aspect of this story, and it needs to be underscored. We are, of course, orbiting back to Jefferson's receipt of Banneker's letter and how he forwarded the almanac to a fellow intellectual in France, the Marquis de Condorcet. But Rachel is referring specifically to the fact that Thomas Jefferson also replied by letter directly to Banneker and that Banneker would have valued that reply. And yet, you still have to ask, in the reply, did Jefferson get around to addressing You know, the elephant in the room, that blistering accusation of hypocrisy. No, he kind of dodges it. And this is something I learned from Ibram X. Kendi, that he had a sort of standard boilerplate response to abolitionists, apparently. And so this letter had that in it. But it was also appreciative in a way. I mean, he he said... No one wishes more than I to see examples of intelligence like you demonstrate and to see that the present condition of Africans is due to their situation. You know, he he was constantly writing about deficiencies in intellect, writing about African people as lesser humans. He had published, Jefferson had published that in Notes on the State of Virginia, and Banneker knew that as he wrote him. So, To get this response from Jefferson was very powerful. Banneker took those letters and published them in the next year's almanac, which made a lot of trouble for Jefferson. Political heat, that is. Here's what happened. Benjamin Banneker and his abolitionist Quaker friends made this brief correspondence a source of pride, and they happily saw it go to press in an edition of the almanac. With that letter put into print and widely circulated, Jefferson's dodge had failed. His Federalist opponents in the 1796 and 1800 presidential campaigns would accuse him of being a secret abolitionist. Benjamin Banneker and Us 11 Generations of an American Family is the title of Rachel Webster's multi-generational saga. We're now headed for subsequent ancestral choices and decisions, all of which were informed inexorably by the long-standing racial divide in America. How would generation after generation come to terms with this divide, its cost, its violence, its tragedy? Banneker died in 1806. He was 74 years old foreshadowing treatment that would come to his family later on, the very day of his funeral, his cabin was set ablaze. Someone wanted to obliterate the fact that he had ever existed. No physical violence or bodily injury befell anybody that day, but the arsonist's aim was clearly to expunge his memory by wiping out his goods and effects, his material and intellectual legacies. Unfortunately, on the day of Benjamin Banneker's funeral, when everyone was gathered to honor this extraordinary man, his cabin was set on fire and almost everything was lost. 
So we know that Benjamin had many books because some of his visitors had written about his library. We can assume that he had uh, volumes and volumes of writing in his cabin because he was such an excellent writer. And that doesn't happen if you just write a few things. Usually happens because there's a lot of practice. There's a lot of correspondence going on. One of his manuscript journals was saved because his nephew, Greenberry Morton, went over to get a cartload of belongings right after Benjamin passed away, and he brought them to Benjamin's best friend, George Ellicott. So because of that, we have this one manuscript journal which shows his astronomical computations. It shows some of his poems, his writings about his dreams, but so much has been lost. In the 80s, they did an archaeological dig at the site of the cabin and they found thousands of small instruments, scientific instruments, writing pencils, broken dishes, farm implements. They found lots of evidence of Benjamin's life in the cabin. But of course, all of that writing, all of that paper would have been gone. We do still have the one manuscript journal and we have the almanacs that he published, best-selling almanacs. So we have evidence of his intellect and his industry as a thinker. uh, But It does make you sick and really sad to think about how much was lost in that fire. After Benjamin's death, slavery in America would grow more and more entrenched as an economic and social way of life. To be black and free was increasingly dangerous. Any day might bring harassment and violence. So we all descend from Benjamin's sister, Jemima. She married Samuel Delaney Lett, and they all moved to Frederick, Maryland. There was a community of free people of color there in Frederick, so a little further west, and they were able to farm and have sort of a self-sustaining community. But in Maryland, after the Revolutionary War, there were more and more manumissions, so there were lots of free people of color, but then there was a white legislative backlash. A key turning point came when the nephew of Benjamin, whom Rachel has mentioned, Greenberry Morton, saw his own property and voting rights revoked. Greenberry Morton had always been able to vote as a landowning man, and then the year after Benjamin died, he was no longer allowed to vote. So the family saw that their rights were being taken away, People were starting to be sort of hunted down and could be captured and put back into slavery. So they pooled their resources and migrated up to Ohio, where my family still lives. So they entered the new Northwest Territory of Ohio. Ohio was seen as this very hopeful place because the original charter laws did not designate skin color with voting rights or land holding rights. So a lot of free people of color had so much hope about Ohio that they could come and they could start over and have their community. Well, they did. They ended up purchasing a thousand acres of land in Meigs County, Ohio, and working with these allied families because these groups of free families of color really looked out for one another because they were an anomaly and they had to do that. So they all worked, they established the Let Homestead, they built their own houses, baked their own bricks, grew their own food, did their own healing. Pretty self-sustaining community. According to history, a fairly respected community in Southern Ohio, people were really impressed by how much they were able to build and create. But then in Ohio, you had a very similar backlash where the laws changed, People of color could no longer own land. They could no longer vote. Things started to get really difficult again. Aquila Lett was sending his children to school, and there were townspeople who would come in and demand to expel the children. And the school teacher at the time, Miss Harmon, refused to do so, and she refused to even identify them, which shows you sort of how arbitrary these color lines can be. In any case, she refused, and our ancestor, Margaret Lett, declared that she was as white as anyone. 
It's a very moving moment for many reasons. One, that Margaret had to claim whiteness in order to get an education, which she really wanted. And two, that Miss Harmon was brave enough to say, no, I will not expel these children. They're good kids. She says that they're well-behaved. They're good students. Why would she throw them out? Well, she lost her job for defending the let children. And then they hired a teacher who would not let the children come to school. So after that, the family sued the county for the right to an education. Eventually, the Lett family won the settlement to establish their own schoolhouse on James Lett's land. And they did that. So they were able to educate their children. Again, the racism was prevalent and horrible. Neighboring townspeople burnt the schoolhouse down three times to try to terrorize them not to send their children to school, but the community persisted and they actually educated generations of children in Southern Ohio. When Jemima Banneker's son, Aquila Lett, took his extended family from the Baltimore area with Benjamin Banneker's burnt cabin out to settle in Southern Ohio, that state had been in existence for only two decades. Then, after the burning and rebuilding and reburning and building three times over of those schoolhouses, the next big family migration took the Lett family further north toward the shores of Lake Erie, where Rachel Webster would eventually grow up. But there's a key question we still haven't answered. When did her branch of the family become white? My family left the Lett settlement in this generation, and our ancestor was Peter Lett, He went up to Crawford County, Pennsylvania, where we think he was working with abolitionist John Brown. And then all of his children left. And now at this point, we're at the Civil War time. So his children left and went to Northeastern Ohio, and they went as a group. So usually the passing story is about one family member leaving the rest of the family and feeling that loneliness. In this particular story, they went as a group of siblings to Mentor, Ohio, which is where my father delivered mail for 40 years and really where I grew up. Grew up without any knowledge of this complex family origin story. Complex because it involves a number of difficult issues that dovetail with racial passing, ranging from denial for the sake of self-preservation, to potential estrangement from one's own family and culture. They had to swear on paper to be entirely white in order to have civil rights. So in order to get legally married, people had to attest to being totally white, and they had to have witnesses attest to that. And it looks like what happened is the lightest skin members of the family They were the ones who went to the courthouse. So there's this one brother-in-law who signs for the other family members and says, yes, they're entirely white so that they can become legally married, so that they can be part of the society they want to be part of. And this was not privileged, upper crusty society. This is just the ability to get a job to go to school. So basically, my family passed over as a group and they used the lighter skin members to say that they were white for those who would have visibly not appeared to be white. In the census of 1850, Susan, my ancestor, is listed as mulatto. And in the census of 1870, she's listed as white. So then we have a few generations in which people knew about this or didn't, and suppressed it. And so it becomes a subterranean situation, or it becomes a form of denial that is, once you're a few generations out, it's not a literal denial, but I actually believe we still feel it. So my experience when I learned this history was not surprise at all. It was this relief in the sense that when, when something's been denied, it becomes sort of a discord in the body. 
And to have it be stated and understood, it almost felt like a like an exhale, like, oh, I understand something makes more sense now. Rachel Webster says that for many years she had sensed something was amiss in her family's story, but she couldn't quite put her finger on it. This discovery not only helped her toward resolving that subliminal tension, but also led her to write an article in 2018 titled White Lies and Fiction. It's about her personal discovery of her let ancestors. Two years later, a Facebook message pops up unexpectedly. It's from Edie Lee Harris, a woman who writes, I saw your op-ed and would love to talk about your family. They schedule a phone conversation. Edie, you know, she, she began that conversation saying, at first when I saw your article, I was like, who is this writing about my family? And then she said, and then I realized you're one of ours. I started crying. Um, it, (laughs) so I'm getting emotional right now. Um, I felt so much gratitude to her that she would reach out to me and call me cousin. And I also felt an intense familiarity with her. And later she said, I had your people all mapped out on paper for years, and I've been waiting for one of you to get in touch. So If I had to describe the feeling, it was like being a part of something much bigger than me as an individual and feeling this gratitude that I'm brought into the fold. You know, she said, you know, my I'm a lawyer. My father was a doctor. My entire life has been about compiling evidence. And then she said, but I've had experiences ever since I've been researching the ancestors that are almost too amazing to be believed. Rachel's encounter with Edie opened the door to many other Let cousins. One is a woman you might call the matriarch of the extended group, Gwen Maribel. We call Gwen Maribel the spiritual leader of our family, which is accurate. She's 90 years old. She's completely present. She is extraordinary. And she helped me to acknowledge all the levels we were working on. So very early on, she acknowledged the spiritual connection between us. And by acknowledging that, we could work from that. And then she also taught me that this is Grio work that this relationship with our ancestors goes back to Africa and it is an African way of thinking about knowledge and thinking about truth. And so I often, you know, I wrote a lot of my own ethical questions into the book and my questions about me telling the story. But the truth is, whenever I would hit a moment of doubt, I would have some amazing... uh, coincidence happen or some beautiful confirmation happen to lead me forward. And often it came from Gwen, this encouragement and this recognition that um, that things were happening in the pace and the way that they should be. Gwen lives in a Quaker retirement community, and she has learned a lot from the Quaker mindset. And she taught me this saying, way will open. And this idea that when you feel stuck, when you feel unsure, sit back, meditate, find your center, and the way will open. And that kept happening with this book. And there were just so many moments that seemed uh, divinely or that seemed beautifully uh, ordered and patterned. And we learned to show up for them and Uh, create something together that was more harmonious than we could have imagined or ever done on our own. Shortly after meeting Edie Lee Harris, Rachel was introduced to Robert Lett, a 70-year-old high school guidance counselor and coach. Even in their first emails, Robert began listing out names of ancestors and living cousins who knew the stories of the Banneker Lett family. Robert quickly became a key contributor to Rachel's research. 
he and I had the most tension in our conversation. We had the most to navigate in terms of not believing we could communicate because of gender, because of race, because of age, perhaps. And yet we are so much alike. It's amazing. As we collaborated, we shared so much research. They shared links to documents with me, articles, books, and I with them. But um, we also shared our intuition. We also had our own mystical moments of I would just be researching something and Robert would be sending me links and articles about that very subject. This happened so often that we started to almost, we, we weren't even as surprised. It was level a level of what we would call synchronicity or some sort of mystical collaboration that we all felt and we just learned to say thank you for it and maybe giggle a little and continue on. We all felt it. It was kind of a, oh, hello, you're here. And Gwen had said, we'd been waiting for someone to show up to write this book. And so um, it was it was just an amazing feeling to have that level of recognition and to everyone's credit, that desire to be part of something bigger than any of us. I mean, you can't be a character in a book and be perfect. And the fact is, it's humbling to show up in someone else's book. It's even a humbling for me to look at some of my own moments in this book. But we all knew that it was worth it, that if we could share our conversations and our family stories for some greater good and, and to, to tell the stories of the ancestors, then that's what we wanted to do. I'm Marcus Smith. Thanks for joining with us for this amazing journey. Our sincere thanks goes to Rachel Jamison Webster. She's author of Benjamin Banneker and Us, 11 Generations of an American Family. This episode was produced by Eric Schultzka with help from Lily Jensen and Colson Darrington. Sound design was by Mitchell Towsley and Dallin Jepson. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.